It is very apparent that uh, President Biden has been struggling over the past several months, if not the past several years. He has a lot of individuals who are in his corner in the Democratic Party. He has a lot of individuals who have stated publicly that perhaps they should consider having him move aside. One of his biggest supporters for quite some time, as most of you may know, has been Nancy Pelosi. Well, here she is stating what she believes the voters have a right to question. Is this an episode or is this a, a condition? And so when people ask that question, it's completely legitimate of both candidates. Because what we saw on the other side was a lying of Justin. You know, I tore up his speech when he lied to the Congress on every single page of his State of the Union. We should be tearing up what he said the other day because it was a pack of lies. And it's very hard to debate somebody when you have to undo or debunk everything they're saying. But, so but again, are there I think both candidates, both candidates owe whatever uh, uh, test you want to put them to in terms of their mental acuity and their health, both of them. Now, that was Nancy Pelosi as she was speaking, saying that, hey, you know what? Both of the candidates have an issue. But is that really the problem when you consider this is your candidate? This is the individual that you guys have put forward? She did start it out by being very honest, saying, hey, you know what? People should be concerned because there is a reason to be concerned. But let's listen here. Bring such wisdom, judgment, experience to the job of presidency, and uh, he is a great president, and will continue to be a great from the beginning. I think that uh, Joe Biden is brings such wisdom, judgment, experience to the job of presidency, and uh, he is a great president, and will continue to be a great president. Uh, his experience is an advantage to us, and not to be described as a disadvantage. But again, it's all. It's a relative thing. If your health is not good and the rest, then then uh, there may be a factor to be considered there. Uh, so uh, I, I appreciate what Senator Romney said. And, and uh, I don't know why. That, I, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because when we're with the president, he's vigorous. He's on top of the situation. He is uh, so knowledgeable. And you, you would see him meet somebody and say, tell me how your younger son is. And I know he was going to college. He has a great memory, which is part of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, something that might be in question as, as time goes by. Now, if anybody is thinking like me, you're thinking this is the last person that you would want to get up and speak for him, especially considering the fact that as you get older, your faculties do begin to sway or, you know, leave you just a little bit. The next thing that we're going to look at is specifically what he said on July the 5th, 2014, while he was in an interview with George Stephanopoulos. And I guess my question is, do you think it's time for him to say goodbye? Do you feel that it's elder abuse for him to continue and that no one in his family, especially his wife, has pulled his coattail in his defense to say, hey, babe, it's time for you to let it go. I would imagine that for the Democratic Party specifically, he would feel that it's better for him to set aside some time for him to heal and some time for him to get well. Now, you guys know I could rip him a new one and make all kinds of jokes, but I think that it's really time for us to put all the jokes aside and to just allow the chips to fall where they may and honestly admit it's really time for him to go and it's time for them to exercise the 25th Amendment, which as you guys heard me say last evening, uh, I believe that's exactly what they want to happen. I believe that's exactly what they want to do utilize the 25th Amendment, which is something that I shared with uh, a few people that I know personally here in the chat uh, in, in a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation. I remember sharing with Bettina, and I said this to you guys here also in the chat, that I thought that they were going to allow him to show his weaknesses. And then after they allowed you know, this to happen, they would then go forward 
and put in who they wanted to win. And the reason why, as I shared last night, why I believe that it will be Hillary Clinton is because she is not a quitter. And she did say she wasn't going to run again. This would prevent her from having to run. If they allowed the American public to see this and then had to remove him with the 25th Amendment, then there would be nobody else better or more equipped who has a relationship with other nations, who knows different nations. Uh, as we're looking as far as her skill set is concerned, I'm not by any means at all, by no stretch of the imagination, am I <clears throat> saying that she's a great candidate. What I'm saying is, if you look at the fact, in all fairness, that she does have relationships with foreign countries, she does understand having been the Secretary of State and having worked in the Obama administration, as well as having been very closely nested to her husband, she does have that relationship with foreign nations. And so I think it's important for us to consider that. So let's just go on ahead and take a look at what President Biden did last evening when he sat down with George Stephanopoulos there on uh, ABC News. And we'll take it from the beginning. And what we're going to do, because we don't own this, we are utilizing it specifically for commentary specifically for us doing this reaction video. And we're, we're going to chunk it and we're going to break it down. So let's get into that. And uh, we'll come back as this is going, as we're supposed to. And we're going to share this and we're going to talk about it as it's playing. Because again, in order for us to qualify it as, in order for it to be qualified as a review, we got to do that. So let's get into it. Since that poor debate performance against Donald Trump, President Biden says he is committed to staying in the race and confident that he will prevail and beat Donald Trump. The president was directly called on to answer for his faltering appearances and whether he still has the mental and physical fitness for another term in the White House. Our team is standing by, of course, for analysis. But first, let's get to the interview. Mr. President, thank you for doing this. Thank you for having me. Let's start with the debate. Uh, you and your team said have said you had a bad night, but your <laughs> but your friend Nancy Pelosi actually framed the question that I think is on the minds of millions of Americans: Was this a bad episode or the sign of a more serious condition? It's a bad episode. Uh, no indication of any serious condition. I was exhausted. I didn't listen to my instincts in terms of preparing, and I had a bad night. You know, you say you were exhausted, and, and I know you've said that before as well, but you came, and you did have a tough month, but you came home from Europe about 11 or 12 days before the debate, spent six days in Camp David. Why wasn't that enough rest time, enough recovery time? Because I was sick. I was feeling terrible. Matter of fact, the docs with me, I asked if they did a COVID test because they're trying to figure out what's wrong. They did a test to see whether or not I had uh, some infection, you know, a virus. I didn't. I just had a really bad cold. And did you ever watch the debate afterwards? I don't think I did, no. Well, what, I'm trying, what I want to get at is what were you experiencing as you were going through the debate? Did you know how badly it was going? Yeah, look, the whole way I prepared, nobody's fault of mine. Nobody's fault of mine. I, uh, I prepared what I usually would do, sitting down, as I did come back with foreign leaders or the National Security Council for explicit detail. And I realized about partway through that, you know, all the, I get quoted, the New York Times had me down at 10 points before the debate, nine now or whatever the hell it is. The fact of the matter is that what I looked at is that he also lied 28 times. I couldn't, I mean, the way the debate ran not my fault, no one else's fault, no one else's fault. But it but, seemed like you were having trouble from the first question in, even before he spoke. Well, I just had a bad night. Maybe that's a bad night once in a while. I, I can't remember any, but I'm sure you do. I've had plenty. Right. I, I guess the question, the, the problem is here for a lot of Americans watching, is you've said, going back to 2020, watch me. Yep. to people who are concerned about your age. And, you know, 50 million Americans watched that debate. It seemed to confirm fears they already had. Well, look, after that debate, I did 10 major events in a row, including until 2 o'clock in the morning after that debate. I did events in North Carolina. I did events in, in 
in Georgia did events like this today, large crowds, overwhelming response, no, no, no slipping. And so I just had a bad night. I don't know why. And how, how quickly did it, did it come to you that you were having that bad night? Well, Kenya was having a bad night when I realized that even when I was answering a question, even when they turned his mic off, he was still shouting. And I, I let it distract me. I, I'm not blaming on that. But I realized that I just wasn't in control. Well, part of the other concern is that uh, this seems to have fit into a pattern of decline that has been reported on recently. New York Times had a headline on July 2nd, Biden's lapses are said to be increasingly common and worrisome. Here's what they wrote. People who have spent time with President Biden over the last few months or so said the lapses appear to have grown more frequent, more pronounced, and after Thursday de Thursday's debate, more worrisome. By many accounts, as evidenced by video footage, observation, and interviews, Mr. Biden is not the same today as he was even when he took office three and a half years ago. Similar reporting in the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal. Are you the same man today that you were when you took office three and a half years ago? In terms of successes, yes. I also was the guy who put together a peace plan for the Middle East that may become into fruition. I was also the guy that expanded NATO. I was also the guy that grew the economy. All the individual things that were done were ideas I had or I fulfilled. I moved on. And so, for example, you know, well, well that was true then. What's Biden done lately? Did you just today? Just announced 200,000 new jobs. We're moving in a direction that no one's ever taken on. I know you know this from the days in the, in the, in the, in the government. I took on big pharma. I beat them. No one said I could beat them. I took on all the things we said we got done. We are told we couldn't get done. And part of it is what I said when I ran was I want to do three things. Restore some decency to the office. Restore some support for the middle class instead of trickle-down economics built from the middle out and the bottom up, the way the wealthy still do fine, everyone does better, and unite the country. But what has all that work over the last three and a half years cost you physically, mentally, emotionally? Well, I, I just think it cost me a really bad night, bad run. But, you know, I, George, I, I have, I'm optimistic about this country. I don't think we're a country of losers, he points out. I don't think America's in tough shape. I think America's on a cusp of breaking through in so many incredible opportunities. This next term, I'm going to make sure we have a, a straighten out the tax system. I'm going to make sure we're in a situation where we have health care for all people, or we're in a position where we have, have child care and elder care, free up, and all these things. One thing I'm proudest of, and you remember when my economic plan was put forward, a lot of the mainstream economists said it's not going to work. Well, guess what? We now have 16 Nobel laureates, 16 of them in economics, saying that Biden's next term would be, based on what he wants to do, enormous success. Trump's plan would cause a recession, would significantly increase inflation. I've made great progress, and that's what I plan on doing, and we can do this. I, I, I understand that, and I'm not disputing that. What I'm asking you is uh, about your personal situation. Do you dispute that there have been more lapses, especially in the last several months? Can I run the 110 flat? No, but I'm still in good shape. Are you more frail? No. I know you Come spoke... my schedule. <laughs> I know you spoke with your doctor after the debate. What did he say? He said, he just looked at me. He said, you're exhausted. I said, look, I have medical doctors travel me everywhere. Every president does, as you know. Medical doctors, some of the best in the world, travel me everywhere I go. I have an ongoing assessment of what I'm doing. And they don't hesitate to tell me if they think there's something wrong. I know you said you have an ongoing assessment. Have you had a full neurological and cognitive evaluation? I, have, I get a full neurological test every day. With okay, so now he says he's getting a full neurological test every single day. I don't know if anybody out there has any neurological issues, but I personally do. And I don't think that anybody really understands what a full neurological, a battery of neurological tests looks like. 
with his schedule as the president of the United States, I don't know how he could go through a full neurological test every single day. These are the types of comments I think draw a big, just a huge pause from people. Personally, I'm much younger than he is. And personally, I don't think I could go through an entire battery of tests on a daily basis. Maybe he's stronger than most, but let's just see, you know, where he's going with this because I can't, I can't see that. In tandem with that, there are a few other things that trouble me here. It, it, it appears that what he's trying to do, George Stephanopoulos, is trying to gracefully get him to say, hey, you know what? I do probably need to bow out a little bit. But he is combating. The president is going opposite of everything George Stephanopoulos is trying to sort of help him out with. It's almost like he's trying to help him out of the confusion, and he puts himself right back in the weeds. Let's continue. And I've had a full physical. I had, you know, I mean, I've, I've been a Walter Reed for my physicals. I mean, uh, for, yes. I, I know your doctor said he consulted with a neurologist. I, I guess I'm asking a, a slightly different question. Have you had the specific cognitive tests and have you had a neurologist, a specialist, do an examination? No, no one said I had to. No one said they said I'm good. Would you be willing to undergo an independent medical evaluation that included neurological and cognitive, cognitive tests and release the results to the American people? Look, I have a cognitive test every single day. Every day I have that test. Everything I do, you know, not only am I campaigning, but I'm running the world. Not, and that's not how it sounds like hyperbole, but we are the central nation in the world. I don't know if I was right. And every single day, for example, today, before I come out here, I'm on the phone with the with Prime Minister of, well, anyway, I shouldn't get into the detail, but with Netanyahu, I'm on the phone with the new Prime Minister of England. I'm working on what we're we'll doing with regard to in Europe with regard to expansion. Okay, right now I'm going to give you guys what an you know a cognitive test, also known as a neurophysiological test, measures a variety of mental functioning abilities. They can involve answering questions or performing tasks that assess such areas as your memory, thinking processes, language ability to identify things, math skills, visual and spatial skills, orientation, attention, and ability to follow commands. Some of the cognitive tests may even include a 15-minute test that includes memorizing a list of words, copying a shape, and categorizing images. The mini mental state test or the MMSE is a 10 minute test that includes identifying the date, counting backwards and identifying objects. There's a mini cog that is a three minute test that includes a memory recall test and a clock drawing test. So there are several different types of tests that you could take. I don't believe he's done any of these on a daily basis. I honestly don't. And if it were possible for him to have done one prior to the debate, I believe that especially as tired as he says that he was, he would not have been able to pass it the way that he feels that he passed it. I'm not saying that he didn't do any of this. What I'm just saying is that it's highly unlikely. And this is just my assessment, right? What I know, because I know that for me, when I have gone through these tests, from 2006 all the way up until not not long ago there you know you decline if you have some type of neurological problem there is a major decline especially if age is a factor as well as having a neurological disability as i do so i'm only speaking from a personal standpoint you guys have got to let me know down below in the comments or there in the comments here live what you think but let's just continue and let him finish speaking for himself. To the NATO and whether it's going to stick. I'm taking on Putin. I mean, every day, there's no day I go through. They're not those decisions I have to make every single day. And you have been doing that, and the American people have been watching, yet their concerns about your age and your health 
are growing. So that's why I'm asking, could, to reassure them, would you be willing to have the independent medical evaluation? Watch me between, there's a lot of time left in this campaign. It's over 125 days. The sad part is, is that nobody has the time to watch him. If you're a part of the Democratic Party, or if you are a part of the Democratic machine, say, for example, this is 110% real. You need to be very concerned about this as your top candidate. Nobody has time to wait till the 125 days to lapse. Nobody and their mama got that kind of time. So I don't think, if, we, listen, we've got to choose a side in order for us to really evaluate this George Stephanopoulos exclusive interview. Let's just for a moment pretend that every single thing we're looking at is pure, true, and honest. And if that's the case, there isn't 125 days. As a matter of fact, they're about 126 short of having had some type of resolve. So the answer, the right answer right now is no, you, you don't want to do that, right? No, I've already done it. You talked a lot about your successes in the, at the beginning of this interview, and, and I don't want to dispute that. I don't want to debate that. But as you know, elections are about the future, not the past. They're about tomorrow, not yesterday. And the question on so many people's minds right now is, can you serve effectively for the next four years? George, I'm the guy that put NATO together, the future. No one thought I could expand it. I'm the guy that shut Putin down. No one thought it could happen. I'm the guy that put together the South Pacific initiative with AUKUS. I'm the guy that got 50 nations, out, not only in Europe, outside of Europe as well, to help Ukraine. I'm the guy that got Japanese to expand their budget. I'm the, so, I mean, these, and for example, when I decided we used to have 40% of the computer chip, and we invented the chip, a little chip for the computer chip. It's in everything from cell phone to weapons. And so we used to have 40% and we're down to virtually nothing. So I get in the plane against the advice of everybody and I fly to South Korea. I convince them to invest in the United States, billions of dollars. Now we have tens of billions of dollars being invested in the United States, making us back in a position where we're going to own that industry again. We have, I mean, I, I guess, anyway. I don't want to take too much credit. I have a great staff. But all the, my, I guess my point is all that takes a toll. Do you have the mental and physical capacity to do it for another four years? I believe so. I wouldn't be run if I didn't think I would did. Look, I'm running again because I think I understand best what has to be done to take this nation to a completely new level. We're on our way. We're on our way. And look, the decision recently made by the Supreme Court on immunity. You know, the next president of the United States, it's not just about whether he or she knows what they're doing. It's, it's, it's not, not about a, con a conglomerate of people making decisions. It's about the character of the president. The character of the president is going to determine. Okay, I've got to stop it because I've got to answer the question. Uh, he said that he is the guy that put NATO together. The North Atlantic Treaty Organization was created in 1949 by the United States, Canada, and several Western European nations to provide collective security against the Soviet Union. Signing the NATO Treaty was the first peacetime military alliance the United States entered into outside of the Western Hemisphere. After the destruction of the Second World War, the nations of Europe struggled to rebuild their economies and ensure their security. The former required a massive influx of aid to help the worn torn landscapes reestablish industries and produce food, and the latter required assurances against the resurgent Germany or incursions from the Soviet Union. The United States viewed as an economically strong, rearmed, and integrated Europe as a vital end prevention of the communist expansion across the continent. As a result, Secretary of State George Marshall proposed a program of large-scale economic aid to Europe. The resulting European Recovery Program, or Marshall Plan, not only facilitated European economic integration, but promoted the idea of shared interest and cooperation between the United States and Europe. 
Soviet refusal to participate in the Marshall Plan or allow its satellite states in Eastern Europe to accept the economic assistance helped to reinforce the growing division between the East and the West Europe. In Europe, in 1947 and 1948, a series of events caused the nations of Western Europe to become concerned about their physical and political security, and the United States became more closely involved with European affairs. The ongoing civil war in Greece, alongside with the tensions in Turkey, led the president, Harry Truman, to assert that the United States would provide economic and military aid to both countries, as well as to any other nation struggling against an attempt at subjugation. A Soviet-sponsored coup in Czechoslovakia resulted in a communist government coming to power on the borders of Germany. Attention also focused on elections in Italy as the Economist Party, excuse me, as the Communist Party, had made significant gains among Italian voters. Furthermore, events in Germany also caused concern. The occupation and the governance of Germany after the war had long been disputed, and in the mid-1948, Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin chose to to test the the Western resolve by implementing a blockade against West Berlin which was then under joint U.S., British, and French control by surrounding, I don't hear his name anywhere in this, by surrounding, uh, but surrounded by Soviet-controlled East Germany. This Berlin crisis brought the United States and the Soviet Union to the brink of conflict, although a massive airlift to resupply the city for the duration of the blockade helped to prevent an outright confrontation These events caused the United States officials to grow increasingly wary of the possibilities that the countries of Western Europe might deal with their security concerns by negotiating with Soviets. To counter this possible turn of events, the Truman administration considered the possibilities of forming a European-American alliance that would commit the United States to bolstering the security of Western Europe. The Western European countries were willing to consider a collective security solution. In response to increasing tensions and security concerns, representatives of several countries of Western European, of Western Europe gathered together to create a military alliance. Great Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands, as well as Luxembourg, signed the Brussels Treaty in March 1948. Their treaty provided collective defense. If any of these nations was attacked, the others were bound to help to defend it. At the same time, the Truman administration instituted a peacetime draft, increased military spending, and called upon the historically isolationist Republican Republican Congress to reconsider a military alliance with Europe in May of 1948. Republican Senator Arthur H. Vandenberg proposed a resolution suggesting that the president seek a security treaty with Western Europe that would adhere to the United Nations Charter, but exist outside the Security Council where the Soviet Union held veto power. The Vandenberg resolution passed and negotiations began for the North Atlantic Treaty. In spite of general agreement on the concept behind the treaty, it took several months to work out the exact terms. The United States Congress had embraced the pursuit of the international alliance, but it remained concerned about the wording of the treaty. The nations of Western Europe wanted assurances that the United States would intervene automatically in the event of an attack, but under the United States Constitution, the power to declare war rested with Congress. Negotiations worked toward finding language that would reassure the European states, but not obligate the United States to act in a way that violated its own laws. Additionally, European contributions to the collective security would require large-scale military assistance from the United States to help to rebuild Western Europe's defense capabilities, while the European nations argued for individual grants and aid. The United States wanted to make aid conditional on regional coordination. 
A third issue was the question of scope. The Brussels Treaty signatories preferred that membership in the alliance be restricted to the members of that treaty plus the United States. The U.S. negotiators felt there was more to be gained from enlarging the new treaty to include countries of the North Atlantic, including Canada, Iceland, Denmark, Norway, Ireland, and Portugal. Together, these countries held the territory, held territory that formed a bridge between the opposite shores of the Atlantic Ocean, which would facilitate military action if it became necessary. Again, here's a major name. President Truman inspected. A <laughs> President Truman is all over this. I don't see him anywhere here, which was my main purpose for reading the preponderance of this article, which will be down below in the comments, or I should say, in the description for you to read at your leisure. I don't see him here. What does he mean by he's the guy that put NATO together? What does that mean exactly? This comes from the Office of the Historian. It's history.state.gov under milestones. Let's continue with this George Stephanopoulos, ABC News exclusive. Whether or not this constitution is employed the right way. And we should note that ABC News offered Donald Trump the same opportunity for a one on one interview, and he declined. We'll have more of George Stephanopoulos' exclusive interview with President Biden in just 60 seconds. Stay with us. So, as far as the first portion of this interview was concerned, what do you think? We'll go on ahead and take it to the rest of this. I want to see what else this has. Um, as you and I, as you know, always watch things together. It's never like I watch it first and then pull it up. So let's just fast forward just a bit here, right there. What is this? We are here in Israel, a nation at war. In rolling for this tornado tore through this town. Okay, Let me there you go. For more personal questions. Are you sure you're being honest with yourself when you say you have the mental and physical capacity to serve another four years? Yes, I am, because, George, the last thing I want to do is not be able to meet that. I think as some of the senior economists and senior foreign policy specialists say, if I stop now, I go down to history as a pretty successful president. No one thought I could get done when we got done. But are you being with honest with yourself as well about your ability to defeat Donald Trump right now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. You say that, and let me challenge you. Sure. Because you were close, but behind going into the debate. Um, you're further behind now, by, by any measure. It's been a two-man race for several months. Inflation has come down. In those last few months, he's become a convicted felon, yet you're still falling further behind. You guys keep saying that. George, do you, look, do you know polling better than anybody? Do you think polling data is accurate as it used to be? I don't think so, but I think when you look at all of the polling data right now, it shows that he's certainly ahead in the popular vote, probably even more ahead in the battleground states. And one of the other key factors there is it shows that in many of the battleground states, the Democrats who are running for Senate in the House are doing better than you are. Well, that's not unusual in some states. I carried an awful lot of Democrats last time I ran in 2020. Look, I remember them telling me the same thing in 2020. I can't win. The poll show, I can't win. Remember 2024, 2020, the red wave was coming. Before the vote, I said, that's not going to happen. We're going to win. We did better in an off year than almost any incumbent president ever has done. They said in 2023, all the tough races were not going to win. I went into all those areas, all those, all those districts, and we won. All that is true, but 2020 was a close race, and your approval rating has dropped significantly since then. I think the last poll I saw was at about 36 percent. The oh, number of Americans who think you're too old to serve has doubled since 2020. Wouldn't the clear-eyed political calculus tell you that it's going to be much tougher to win in 2024? Not when you're running against a pathological liar. Not when he hadn't been challenged in a way that he's about to be challenged. Not when people- You've had months to challenge him. Oh, I sure had months, but I was also doing a hell of a lot of other things, like wars, 
around the world, like keeping NATO together, like working anyway. So look, do you really believe you're not behind right now? I think it's all the pollsters I talk to tell me it's a toss up. It's a toss up. And when I'm behind, there's only one poll I'm really far behind, CBS poll and NBC, I mean, excuse me, and uh, New, York, New York Times and NBC, both you have. This guy actually believes that he's not behind the polls in the polls. Is it that they're not allowing him to see it? Can he not get this as public record? I mean, all of these polls are literally published and albeit some may have a margin of error, you know, one percentage to the next, but there's no way possible that he can actually believe that he's ahead in the polls. This tells me that there's a problem. Listen, there, you know, as a whole, I know that all of us at one point or another have been involved in, you know, something, whether it's running for government in high school or running for a position in college, or just basically dealing with something in our own world where we have to see whether it's our finances or whatever it is, whether we are doing good or whether we're not doing well at all. Who is it that's giving him the information that he is touting publicly? He's being pummeled in the polls, absolutely pummeled. And it makes it very hard to understand how he can't see it. But this is a problem when you're considering the possibility that what we're looking at, mind you, we're not going to use any of the theories that we may all personally share. We're simply going to look at the facts of what this is on face value. It's impossible that this cat does not know he is getting pummeled and he's making it worse every day. Have you yeah, about six points right. behind in the popular vote? That's exactly right. New York Times had me behind before anything having to do with this race. Had me behind, behind 10 points. 10 points had me behind. Nothing's changed substantially in the New York Times poll. Just when you look at the reality, though, Mr. President, I mean, you won the popular vote uh, in, in 2020, but it was still deadly close in the electoral By college. Seven million votes. Yes, but you're behind now in the popular vote. I don't. I don't buy that. Is it worth the risk? I don't think anybody's more qualified to be president or win this race than me. You know, the heart of your case against Donald Trump is that he's only out for himself, putting his personal interests ahead of the national interest. How do you respond to critics who say that by staying in the race, you're doing the same thing? Oh, come on. Well, I don't think those critics know what they're talking about. They're just wrong? It's wrong. Look, Trump is a pathological liar. Trump is, he, he is, have you ever seen anything Trump did that benefited and saw somebody else, not him? I know you can't answer, I know. I've, I've questioned him and his allies as persistently as any journalist. Has. Oh, I know you have. I'm not being yeah. critical. Yeah. I'm not being critical. But look, I mean, the man is a congenital liar. Okay, we're going to stop it right here. And uh, he's saying that Trump is a pathological liar. All right, no problem. Let's take a listen to him. And we'll come back to this in just a moment. This is the portion of the radio broadcast that I wish I had last evening that I mentioned I really wish that I had it. Well, here is the portion of him talking on the radio. Now, I don't, listen, okay, <laughs> let's, let's be fair. If this cat said that cognitively he's in shape, that he is the best candidate, that there is nothing wrong with him, then we have to take this at face value. By the way, I'm proud to be, as I said, the first vice president, first black woman, mm -hmm. served with a black president. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of the, all the first black woman in the Supreme Court. There's just so much that we can do because together, we, there's nothing. Look. This is the United States of America. And that's all I've got to say about that. Because you just said you were healthy. You just said you had a cognitive test every day. 
you just got through saying that not only did you had a cognitive, did you, you know, do you have a cognitive test every day, but you also said that you have a neurological test every day. You said that you're 100% good and you're ready to roll and you're good for it. And there's no other candidate that's as good as you. There's nobody that's better to be fit. There's nobody else who's fit to be president, but you, you just said that. So if that's the case and you are 110% well, you have doctors that travel with you every day. You have cognitive tests that are done daily. You also state you have those neurological tests done daily. You said it. I didn't. But you also just called yourself the first black woman to be a part of the first black president's cabinet. You just said that. Now, I'm paraphrasing, but that's what you just said. So let's go ahead and finish listening to the rest of what he's got to say here with George Stephanopoulos. And again, I have to be fair. I can only take it from what he says. I can't take it from nothing else. I only have to deal with what it is that you're saying. And if that's what you're saying, there's some flies on the buttermilk, baby. As I said, they pointed out in that debate, he lied 27, 28 times a time, you know, whatever number, over 20 times. Talk about how as good his economy was, how he brought down inflation, and how this is a guy who unlike only other president other than him is Hoover, lost more jobs than he created. This is the guy who told us he put bleach in our arms to deal with COVID, with a million, over a million people died. This is the guy who talks about and want to get rid of the health care provision we put in place. This is the guy who wants to give the power back to big pharma, to be able to charge exorbitant prices for drugs. This is the guy who wants to undo every single thing I've done. Every single, every single thing. I, I understand that. I understand that's why you want to stay in the race. But if you convince yourself that only you can defeat him? I convinced myself of two things. I'm the most qualified person to beat him, and I know how to get things done. If you can be convinced that you cannot defeat Donald Trump, will you stand down? It depends if, if the Lord Almighty comes out and tells me that, I might do that. Well, it, I mean, on a more practical level, Washington Post just reported in the last hour that Senator Mark Warner is, is assembling a group of senators together to try and convince you to stand down because they don't think you can win. Well, Mark is a good man. We've never had that. He also tried to get the nomination, too. Mark's not. Mark and I have a different perspective. I respect him. And if... Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries and Nancy Pelosi come down and say, we're worried that if you stay in the race, we're going to lose the House and the Senate. How will you respond? I, I go into detail with them. I've spoken to all of them in detail, including Jim Clyburn, every one of them. They all said I should stay in the race, stay in the race. No one said, none of the people said, I should leave. But if they do? Well, it's like, <laughs> they're not going to do that. You sure? Yeah, sure. Look, I mean, if the Lord Almighty came out and said, Joe, get out of the race, I get out of the race, the Lord Almighty's not coming down. I mean, these hypotheticals, George, if, I mean, if but, all... But it's, it's, it's not that hypothetical anymore. I, I, I grant that the, they have not requested the meeting, but it's been reported... Well, they, I've met with them. I've met with a lot of these people. I've talked with them regularly. I had an hour conversation with Akeem. I had more time than that with Jim Clyburn. I spent time with many hours off and on the last little bit with Chuck Schumer. It's not like I had all the governors, all the governors. I agree that the Lord Almighty is not going to come down. But if, if, if you are told reliably from your allies, from your friends and supporters in the Democratic Party, in the House and the Senate, that they're concerned you're going to lose the House and the Senate if you stay in, what will you do? I'm not going to answer that question. It's not going to happen. What's your plan to turn the campaign around? I saw it today. How many how many people do you get to draw crowds like I drew today? You find me more enthusiastic than today? Huh? I mean, I, I don't think you want to play the crowd game. Donald Trump can draw big crowds. There's no question about that. He can draw a big crowd, but what does he say? Who, who, who does he have? I'm the guy supposedly in trouble. We raised $38 million within four days after this. Over, we have over a million individual contributors. Individual contributors. But less, less than 200 bucks. We have, I mean, I've not seen what you're, you're proposing. 
you haven't seen the, the fall off in the polls. You haven't seen the reports of discontent in the Democratic Party, House Democrats, Senate Democrats. I've seen it from the press. So much to analyze. And so for more insight on this interview, we're joined now by contributing political correspondent Rachel Bade, who's also author of the Politico Playbook. Rachel, thanks for joining us. I would be here. I know that every source you have in Washington is going through the tea leaves and looking at it. Is there anything you or they saw tonight that is moving the, le the needle on this? And, and is even a perfect performance going to move the needle? Yeah, I was hearing even before this interview aired that a perfect performance would sort of just prolong the inevitable right now, that, you know, Biden from the debate is so damaged uh, that people will not forget what happened last Thursday, even if he, you know, has the best interview possible here. And, and because of that sort of line of thinking, I would say that what we saw tonight is actually one of the worst possible scenarios for Democrats. He didn't do so bad that it's obvious and a whole bunch of Democrats are going to come out, go on record and say, it's time for you to step aside. Mm. But he didn't do so amazingly that people are going to forget this. And so they're in this sort of limbo scenario. So, I mean, look, it wasn't as bad as last Thursday, but certainly not great. And that means more Democrats will still have concern. And you know that uh, on Capitol Hill, we're hearing about what Senator Warner is doing. We're hearing that Hakeem Jeffries is meeting with people. What do you think will come out of these meetings? What are you hearing? Yeah, so I think next week is going to be a crazy week, Juju. I mean, the lawmakers have been out for, what, a week now for congressional recess. This means they could avoid the press, they can avoid the cameras and not have to weigh in. But at some point, they're not going to be able to hide anymore. Um, and a lot of people have been talking on background, they've been talking off the record, and they've been very blunt thinking that, you know, the, the Biden campaign, the presidency, his presidency, his presidential campaign is essentially dead. And so we're going to see, I think, a lot more lawmakers come out. I think, you know, Hakeem Jeffries, uh, Chuck Schumer, they're hearing from a lot of concerned members. And these aren't just random members here. I mean, uh, Mark Warner, um, the chair of the Intelligence Committee, he helps Joe Biden get his agenda through Congress. And he has a lot of respect. And this is that. friendly fire. This yes. is a lot going on. Rachel Bade, thank you so much for your insights, as always. Of course. Okay, so we just saw that. We're going to let that go. And then what I want to do is go to David Axelrod. Now, David Axelrod, as you guys know, is a major strategist, and he has worked with um, the previous, uh, well, the former previous administration prior to number 45. But the Democratic strategist Dave, David Axelrod warned that President Biden is, quote, dangerously out of touch with voters on the issues of his age and health following Biden's highly anticipated sit-down interview on ABC News. Quote, the president is rightfully proud of his record, but he's dangerously out of touch with the concerns people have about his capacities moving forward and his standing in this race. Axel Rod wrote in a post on the social media platform X. He continues with, years ago at this time, he was 10 points ahead of Trump. Today, he is six points behind, close quote. Axelrod's comments come shortly after Biden's full interview with ABC News' George Stephanopoulos aired on Friday evening. The interview was the first Biden's uh, since Biden's widely panned debate performance against former President Donald Trump last week. Throughout the interview, Biden described that the debate performance uh, this is how he described the debate performance as a bad night. I was having a bad night, he says, when I realized that even when I was answering a question, when they turned his mic off, he was still shouting and I let it distract me, Biden said, referring to Trump. He also added, I realized that I just wasn't in control. Biden also insisted that he was not behind in the presidential race despite polling showing otherwise. Prior to the airing of the ABC News interview Friday, Representative Mike Quigley, the Democrat of Illinois, became the fourth House Democrat to call on Biden to drop out of the presidential race. Additionally, the Washington Post reported that Senator Mark Warner, a Democrat of Virginia, was working to gather a group of Democratic senators to call on Biden to exit the race. Now, that's exactly what needs to happen, but the point is, are they going to let it happen? Is this what's about to take place? Now, again, we're not going to use any conjecture. We're not going to use any of our, you know, our, you know, 
points in our brain to say, okay, we know that this is a crap show. We're not going to do that. We're going to look at this as face value because in all fairness, that's what we've got to do. No matter how you slice this, this is trouble for this president. And this is trouble for the upcoming election for Democrats. And anybody who's sort of teetering between the Democratic and the Republican Party deciding which direction that they're going to go, the only thing that I can say is we'll have to see who they're going to pull out of their hat because with all of this information coming forward, there's only one thing for sure and two things for certain. Somebody's not going to be running for the nomination or somebody's not going to be running in this race in November. And I strongly, strongly believe that it's going to be this president. Hey everyone, it's me, Felicia of the Lockhart Perspective and Headlines with a Voice. I want to tell you a little secret. This is what I used to do because I don't do it anymore. I would go to the store, buy the barbecue sauce, pour it inside of a bowl, put a whole bunch of different spices, a dash of brown sugar, a dash of maple, and a dash of mustard, stir it all around, and everybody would be like, oh my gosh, this is the best, this is the best. But I was exhausted after all of that, and a lot of times I couldn't remember how many dashes of what I put in it. But I don't have to do that anymore because now I just go to Judge Joe Brown's website and I order his three pack of bottled barbecue sauce. It is by far the best. And I do mean the best barbecue sauce I've ever eaten. And when you go to his website and you order his three pack, you'll see exactly what I mean. Head on over to JJBBBQ.com and order Judge Joe Brown's barbecue sauce. You'll be glad you did. And you're going to tell me about it. I know you will. So um, if you guys have already purchased some of Judge Joe Brown's uh, barbecue sauce, would you please let me know about that down below in the comments? I know that I have, and it is holiday season for those people who, you know, like to cook out, not necessarily taking a part of any of the pagan holidays, but most assuredly, if you're a person who's grilling out right now, you got to use a little sauce and let me know if you've used his, because I personally believe that it is one of the best that I've ever had. Now, as we're getting ready to close here, I want you guys to remember to share this out if you have the ability to do so on your social media. Please remember to also like and then subscribe to this channel if you are not a subscriber. Listen, we carry and deal with a varied amount of different topics. Majority of them are in government. We're dealing with the Dalton, Illinois situation. We're dealing with stuff going on out in California. Obviously, we're dealing with the hot topic right now, which is President Biden. Will he step down or will they just push him out of the way with the uh, 25th Amendment? And we're also looking at a lot of other local stories, both national as well as stories going on overseas. So please, there's always a bunch of good information here on the Lockhart Perspective and Headlines with a Voice. I am Felicia Lockhart, and I want to tell you thank you so very much for joining us. Let us know what you think. Is it time for him to go, or is he okay? I don't know, folks. I don't know. Remember what we always say here on the Lockhart Perspective and Headlines with a Voice, and that is to make sure that you take care of yourself because ain't nobody going to do it if you don't take care of you first. And then you can turn around and take care of everybody else in your sphere. For Headlines with a Voice, this has been the Lockhart Perspective. To receive instant notification each time I upload, please hit the subscribe button and the bell notification. Day.